nice to see you all, or students that are required to be here, by this point, <laughs> against your will. Uh, I'm glad that you're with us. I know some of you have a one o'clock class, so I'll keep an eye on the clock and make sure that we uh, don't go on and on and on. But I do have some geology to offer. And this is an unusual lecture in the sense that I'm going to be showing video clips all through the lecture. It's really fun to make videos. I've been doing more and more of that with guys at Channel 15 here, just a couple of buildings away, Rick Spencer and Chris Smart. And it's programming to go on this television channel. And that's when some people say, well, I, I don't own a television. I, I, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't own a television. I, I read books. I read literature. So. <laughs> So for those of us that have televisions um, or, or laptop computers where we can see programming, this is science. It's not, you know, honey boo boo. This is actually science <laughs> literacy and trying to get the word out. So it's fun to make the videos. I enjoy sharing that. It is kind of creepy and weird to me standing in here watching with you me. It's kind of awkward. So we'll just try to get past that. I'll, I'll hide in the corner so we don't have to go through that. But there is content. There is science to talk about here. And many, maybe most of you are biology students and, and, and know your evolution very well, and so I'll, I'll leave that up to you to how to make connections with what you've learned in your classes with, with uh, salmon runs and things of that nature. I'm just going to simply talk about this beautiful river canyon we have just south of town. And that canyon hasn't always been there. And we think of stuff like, how long has that canyon been there? And who was here first? Was the Yakima River here first? Or were the ridges here first? Most people don't think about stuff like that. But we do. So that's the main question I'd like to pose right off the front. Maybe you know the answer, maybe you don't. Oh, we got people writing stuff down. Good. All right, got to turn in these notes to uh, <laughs> Professor <laughs> huh, huh, huh. Right. No, good. I don't have, I, this is bad news for you note-takers. This is like the only text slide I've got. You're going to have to do some extra work. Who was here first, the Yakima River or Menashe Tash Ridge? Do your computations. Come up with an idea. Let me give you some stuff, little video clips and some other images and maps and things. Maybe you'll change your mind halfway through. Maybe you'll go back and forth. That's okay. That's what we do in science, right? We pose a question. We try to find some evidence. We try to collect evidence. We're willing to change our answer based on the evidence coming in. Okay, good. So, first video clip right off the bat. We're going to start with a map that will transition into a, a portion of a, a program we made. We are talking about this stretch. If I'm yelling, I'm sorry. My ears are plugged up. Okay? Um, there's a stretch of the Yakima River between Ellensburg and Yakima for you West Siders who are still trying to get your bearings over here. So this is a river starting at Snoqualmie Pass going all the way down to Tri-Cities, dumping into the Columbia down there. And we're talking about this stretch where we not only have the Yakima River, but it's a deeply incised river into a canyon system. And we have some rather spectacular ridges that have an orientation northwest, southeast. Not east-west, northwest, southeast. That's important to us in geology. So again, who was here first? If it had, the canyon hasn't always been there, who got established first, the river or the ridges? Let's get an introduction with this clip here. Let's see how the audio works. For starters, we need to study the Yakima River itself. Is that loud enough? Well, I think we do got to get to this river to answer this question. We've got to do our homework and learn how oh, these yeah. rivers work. So let's get over to the Yakima River itself and uh, take a little bit see what we can find out. I got my trusty hammer. Let me take my backpack off. Uh, you know, there's lots of geologists with lots of fancy equipment. Um, I've got my crocs. Um, I've got my hammer. That's about all I need. So, it's a beautiful spring morning. This is water coming off the cascade. Probably going to be a little bit icy. I'm a big boy. I think I can handle it. So, we need to get into this water. We need to collect. Typical rocks that are rivers that are crossed. Let's see what I can find. Aha! Uh Aha! -huh. Uh -huh. Are you noticing something? We want to think like a first grader. We want to make 
simple observations and then get cute once we get those observations together. We've got everybody rounded to some degree, right? You've agreed that these are, are not angular pieces of rock. You also agree that they're roughly the same size. We don't really have boulders. I could go in here and pick out another hundred rocks and I'm pretty confident they're all going to be about this shape and about this size. Rivers have a beautiful ability, a tremendous ability. All right, we get it. All right, good. So, <laughs> that sounds pretty low level to me, but it sounds like we're maxed out with the volume up here, so I'm afraid that's all we got to work with. So we'll, we'll make it happen best we can. So, you bet. We've got this river coming through, and the river has not always been in that course. So we're starting to add some ideas that will help continue to work on this question. And how can I be confident that's true? How can I be confident the river has not always... How can I be confident that this river has had different positions instead of this current position? That was a start. You get into that river and look at classic uh, river deposits. Um, we know that this river is not straight. That's another part of your thinking, perhaps, trying to decide who was here first. This is a beautiful river system with graceful meanders, curves. In, in this particular case, this is the beaver tail bend that most of you know. You're driving south from Ellensburg, and instead of making a nice beeline to Hakama, yeah, how's it going? Not quite what you want. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay, good. All right. Well, good luck with that. <laughs> How about that ramen taste? <laughs> All right. Old people in the room, I don't know if you've noticed this. People feel like they can just kind of come and go as, they, as, they, as, they, as the mood strikes. I'm not so much into that. <laughs> So we've got these tremendous meanders, and, and there's a story there. Those meanders haven't always been there. What's up? Okay, here's Menashtash Ridge. If you've written that down in your little notebook and you're not sure where that is, that's the first ridge south of town. So if you drive to Yakima, uh, you have two choices. You can drive the river road, the canyon road, or you can take Interstate 82, which was constructed in the early 70s, and go up and over this ridge. Again, we're trying to decide geologically how long that ridge has been there. A uh, map of the, of the valley, shaped like a football, central right here, and here's our Yakima River Canyon. The river's coming into the valley, playing around out by the freeway, and then suddenly decides to just blast right through Menashtash. Who was here first, the river or the ridges? We might even take a vote halfway through. I don't know. We'll see how we feel. Um, so maybe you've done some hikes uh, in, the, in, the, in the canyon area. I hope that you have. It's beautiful, especially in springtime when the wind's not turned on. And, um, and we have geology rock layers here. Basalt. This is your only rock name uh, to deal with today. Basalt is the dominant rock type in all of eastern Washington. Ellensburg is here. There are different kinds of lava flow rock in the world. Basalt is the Hawaii-like stuff. It's the most fluid, it's the runniest, it's the highest temperature lava. And when people hear that the rock of at Yakima River Canyon and the rock of all of eastern Washington is basalt and they learn that it's lava, I think they do their own mathematics and they assume that the lava must come from, you know, Rainier or St. Helens, the, the, the volcanoes we have on the horizon. It's not true. It's impossible. The, the chemistry of the Cascade lavas is nothing like the chemistry of these lavas here. So instead, these lavas came from the east, the southeast, a series of fissures or cracks in southeastern Washington, eastern Oregon, even down towards Nevada, for goodness sake. And these lavas then flooded the Pacific Northwest, roughly 15 million years ago. Ellensburg's around the margin of these basalts. And so we we're literally flooding the landscape with this runny lava. We're burying a previously existing topography. And instead of one beautiful cone-shaped volcano we can point to as the source of the lavas, instead, it's kind of disappointing. It's kind of a bummer. And it's a bunch of these buried cracks, these fissures that uh, we're directly tapping the mantle of the earth. 
Um, so 70, 70 miles thick, 75, uh, 70 miles deep. Here's a quick animation trying to give us a visual of this, and it's a little too Blood long. Salt plateaus. Oh, no, this guy's talking a lot. of gas for low viscosity magma erupt again and again over a span of several million years. Straight out of 1952. All right. <laughs> um, hang on. Oh, sorry, I cut him off. Sorry, sorry, sorry. we got to start that again. I'm going to control this. That's what kind of power trip I'm on. All right. So this is, this is eastern Washington pre-15 million years ago. We don't have any of those lavas yet. Now, we form one of these fissures, and we start bringing this Hawaiian-like lava to the surface. And those early flows didn't get very far. They just, they just pooled in the lowest spots. But later on, I mean, there's more than 300 of these flows, 300 separate basalt lava flow, rock, layers. And so check this out. When, when we finally fill all those low spots, these Grand Ronde lavas, we'll let it play let the drama build. When we finally get this stuff to the surface, uh, the early guys have paved the way. So now these flows can literally get to the, to the Oregon coast, from, from, from <coughs> damn near Idaho all the way to the Pacific Ocean, and, and, and lays down the bedrock uh, scene for, for all of eastern Washington. The salt lava making up the bedrock that we see in the walls of the Yakima River Canyon. That's not helping us with our story who came first, but we're laying the groundwork literally. So, lava flow, lava flow, lava flow, lava. There's about a dozen of them right here in the walls of the Yakima River Canyon. A dozen, 12. A small portion of this more than 300 lava flow stack creation. So it's tough to teach this in the field because you only see a small portion of this cake at the same time. How's the texting going back there? <laughs> Told you I was a jerk. <laughs> Just north of Ellensburg, we have Table Mountain. Many of you have been up there for God knows what reason. Uh, Geology-wise, it's insignificant because it's the northern edge of these basalt lavas. So these lavas extend from Table Mountain all the way to Idaho. But there's a benefit to be here in Ellensburg. We're close to the edge of these lavas, so we can get away from these lavas which flooded everything and get into much older geology. I won't go through it, that's not the topic today, but Mount Stewart's made out of a, a granite that's 93 million years old. There's a 150 million year old deep ocean trench rock, serpentinite, that's green if you've done any hiking up in the Ingalls area. There's all sorts of great geology stories from that older uh, set of bedrock layers. But we're talking about the river. Let's go back, see if the volume's any better with this one. But things get interesting when we start finding river rocks in places that rivers are not. Ah, spectacular. There's a red hill in the middle of Ellensburg, Washington, right in town. And we have this glorious outcrop. Most people don't look at it very carefully, but of course we do. Let's be real careful. Let's observe like we've done in other spots already today. Rocks, let me pull them out. Uh-huh. Right, let me collect this here. I'll throw my hammer down. Every one of these guys has rounded corners. Most of these guys, roughly the same size. And if we look carefully, we've got an incredible variety. Now, you're a quick student. You know what this means already, don't you? Rounded rocks, about the same size, incredible variety. Say it with me. River deposit, river deposition. But where's the river? We're in the middle of town. <laughs> the Yakima River that we know and love is at least two miles to the west of it. In other words, this spot is two miles east of the present river. Great evidence that the Yakima River has not always been in its current spot. And our business about channels migrating. Okay, so let me translate. That was evidence that the Yakima River has changed its position laterally. That those present curves that we have of the Yakima River 
have not always been the course of the river. And these conglomerate layers, these, these bedrock layers of all these rounded river rocks are spread all through central Washington. So we can reconstruct this very um, um, ambitious history of the Yakima River, squiggling all over the place like a, like a snake. I don't know, like a snake, like a live snake on a, on a, on a countertop. You know, eventually that belly is going to get all over the tabletop. That's kind of the story with these, with these rivers. If the conditions are right for that, does that help you with the question? Still going back and forth? I won't embarrass you, just trying to think. Uh, quite honestly, I forget what this clip is. Let's look. Pauses like those at Craig's Hill help us understand that rivers don't always stay in place. If the terrain is flat, and if there is enough geologic time, the channel of a river system will naturally begin shifting laterally. Why is this? What causes the river to pick up and move next door? A quick trip to a research lab helps us answer that question. Stream table modeling shows that as rivers age, they go through different stages. At birth, rivers are youthful and straight, but as they age, their meanders become more exaggerated. Why is this? A close look at one curve tells us that fast water on the outside of the curve erodes the land, while on the inside of the curve, slow-moving water deposits settle. The net result? A continual shifting of the river's channels. Well, now we're on to something. Different stages of river development tells us about the region where the river is flowing. If the land is flat, the river is allowed to push through all five stages often going through those stages again and again. Craig's Hill and other deposits like it in the Kittitas Valley build a strong case that the Yakima River... I almost said it. We got away from it. Okay? So maybe most of you are leaning strongly in one direction. And I'm going to put words in your mouth and I'm going to put ideas in your mind just in case you don't have them. <laughs> that's what I paid to do, right? No, that's not, that's not what I paid to do supposed to encourage you to think, but we want to move this along. We need flat land. We need a flat terrain to allow a river to go through these stages of meander development. In other words, we can't get these meanders to develop in a river system unless an area is flat. I don't have a key animation. Uh, I don't have a key animation. It dawns on me. Um, here, but that's, this is what we want. We've got, we've got different stages of a river development. This will help the note takers. This will be gold. When you turn these notes in, all right? And we're looking down on a river. Stage one in developing a river. Rivers haven't always been there. So we get a certain gradient and a river starts to establish itself. And originally, at the first stage, the river is pretty straight, pretty linear, pretty youthful. But as I just described with that little... Uh, animation for Carl Loquist's little stream table lab next door in Dean Hall, those slight curves become more exaggerated curves because of this cutting erosion on the outside of each curve and the deposition on the inside of the curve. Why? Because the fastest moving water is on the outside of these curves. The sluggish water is on the inside of the curves. Again, we can only push through these stages if the area is flat, like back in the, in, the, in the Midwest, the Mississippi River system, for instance. You can see all these stages. There is a fifth stage. What do you suppose it is? A lake. Uh, yeah, how, how are we going to make the lake? Oxford. Yeah, good. Some, some, some folks know that word. So the, the stage five is, is, is kind of going back to stage one in a sense. The river kind of finally says, well, screw this. I'm not going to go all the way around this, this big channel. I'm going to finally whittle away. This is erosion here. This is erosion here. I'm going to just whittle away on this little divide until I can become straight again. But those old meanders are abandoned. And moving water becomes standing water. And these truly are oxbow lakes. Oxbow Lakes. So all of these stages are beautifully on display with the Mississippi River system. If you fly into Memphis, for instance, you just see this 
over and over and over again. Which stage would you say the Yakima River Canyon is in? Four. We got four, right? We're, we're in this. We're in this stage here. And it's a frustrated river <laughs> because the Yakima River is trapped in stage four. It will not get to stage five. We're not going to develop Oxbow Lakes in the future with the Yakima River Canyon. And if that's perplexing to you, I suppose we ought to keep going. That makes sense because i got a few more slides for you. So we're going to leave this meander development idea and now talk about the ridges themselves. Why do we have the ridges? How long have they been around? This is more straightforward, a kind of plate tectonic-like geology. So here's a Google Earth images from Jack Powell and the DNR locally here. Ellensburg's off to the left. Here's the freeway climbing Monashtash Ridge. Viewpoint at the top. On you go to Yakima to hoard up in Costco. <laughs> here's the river itself beautifully meandering through, right? But right across these ridges. I can't, I can't hold it. If you're a river second person, like I'm not going to vote, I guess. But if you said, well, of course, the ridge was there first, and the river just blasted a hole through the ridge. Duh, it's obvious. Well, you're wrong. <laughs> Sorry, you're wrong. I'm hoping to convince you that you're wrong. But one thought is, youthful rivers are straight. And if this ridge was established, and the Yakima decided to cut through it, it would be a pretty linear course, right? It would need high energy to, to cut through. And we've got some of the most craziest, laziest, low energy meanders going right across these ridges. So if you missed the punchline, who was there first? The river was there first. The river was there first and the area was flat. There were no ridges. And now I'm going to try to show you how these ridges developed and how we developed a canyon because of the ridges forming. Jack says we need compression. We need to start squeezing these originally flat rock layers to make these ridges. And when we do so, we form folds. These are geology terms. A syncline is a broad low fold. An anticline is an arch upping fold, up arching fold and back and forth. So, Ellensburg to Yakima, if you take the freeway, you go over three ridges. And each of those ridges is a major upfold. And each of these valleys in between, including the Kittitas Valley, is a downfold. So we take these flat layers and we compress them either up into an anticline or down into a syncline or <laughs> And the Klein Sinclair pair. All right, not prepared. Great. All right. So Ellensburg to Natchez, eventually down to Yakima. Here we go. We've got the orientation. So that's another discussion. Why, if we've got the orientation of these ridges north, west, south, east, can you turn to like this stuff better than the river stuff? I'm a little more pumped up now. All right. This, this, this is tectonic. So we, we need compression, kind of in a north, east, south, westerly direction. And if you know about plates in the Pacific Northwest, if you've taken a Geology 101 you know that there's a big oceanic plate offshore called the Juan de Fuca plate, which is subducting beneath Washington. So in other words, it's coming east, generally. And the North American plate is moving west. So that's a compressional story. You would expect, my point is, you would expect these ridges to be north-south, perpendicular to these two plates colliding. But instead, we've got almost the exactly wrong orientation of these ridges if we're trying to tie it to the collision between the Juan de Fuca plate and the North American plate. All right, so we, we, I'm building towards why we have the compression to form these ridges. Let's skip this one. Oh, great. Now back to another clip. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, it's directly south to Canyon Road. Oh, the old sorry, I know this highway is. winds its way for miles. Sorry. So, We've been doing research locally here at Central in the geology department using GPS, some pretty high-tech, pricey instruments to detect why this compression is happening. Before we get to that, the earliest geologists in the area, the Native Americans, were thinking about this. And they developed a oral tradition 
for the development of the Yakima River. And they voted different than we just tried to vote. They assumed the ridges had always been there and that the river had busted through. And here's their story if you haven't heard it. Not to explain that. Oh, shit. Sorry. <laughs> Directly south of Canyon Road, the old two-lane highway winds its way for miles through the canyon, finally emerging as the city of Yakima. To explain the canyon's formation, the earliest residents of the Northwest, the Chinook people, created a myth involving a fight between a giant beaver and a giant coyote to cut the canyon. For thousands of years, local Native Americans made careful observations of the Yakima River and the ridges of central Washington. As the first geologists of the area, the Chinook people had an explanation for these curious canyon cuttings across the landscape. In the early days of the world, Wishpush, the giant beaver, lived on Lake Cleo. Wishpush always killed all of the animals that wanted to fish there by drowning them in the lake. Coyote, the wisest and most cunning of the animals, made up his mind to kill Wishpush. One day, Coyote speared Wishpush with all of his might, and the giant beaver plunged to the bottom of Lake Cleon, dragging Coyote with him. Coyote fought so desperately with Wishpush that the banks of the lake were torn out, water surged through the break, and they plunged through the mountains. The water rushed madly into the broad Kittitas Valley and formed another lake. The struggle between Coyote and Wishpush continued, and they destroyed the banks of that lake, and they fought as the waters surged madly into the lower Yakima Basin, and a lake was formed at Toppenish. This continued until the fighting animals made it all the way to the Pacific Ocean. Over the past century, classically trained field geologists have also pondered the canyon's formation. They all. All right, so it's kind of cool to think of these Native Americans pondering this question with themselves and coming up with uh, a way to explain this meandering canyon. So we have some tools that are uh, different than their tools, and I want to share those tools with you to, again, try to convince you that the river was, was there before the ridges started to grow. Uh, back at Mississippi, the Mississippi River, yeah, I don't know if you've ever thought of this, you know, this is a beautiful river, big river system, no canyon. There's no Grand Canyon. And yet this is a major drainage of North America. You go to the Colorado River system, and suddenly we've got not only the Grand Canyon here, but thousands of other canyons. What's up? What's going on? Why do we have canyons in one place and not the other? And this is a question that I do in my Geology of Washington class, and we spend 20 minutes and people are chiming in about vegetation and climate and gradient and sediment and all sorts of interesting ideas. The main reason, geologically, is that northern Arizona is uplifting. The, the, the crust is actually driving a little closer to heaven every year. And back in the Midwest, the crust is not lifting at all. So it's tied to this plate tectonic story. And if we're uplifting the crust, that intensifies the erosion. No takers? Uplift intensifies the erosion. Put that one in bold. Underline it a couple times. Uplift intensifies <laughs> erosion. It's not so much these rivers, the Colorado is that powerful. It's that it's draining across an area that is uplifting. And so the erosional power of the river is trying to match that uplift rate tectonically. Uplift intensifies erosion. That's a concept that works for the Colorado Plateau, where Dan is from. It's also important to understand what's going on up here. So, Grand Canyon, yes. Canyons everywhere. The land is alive. The land is lifting. Fractions of millimeters annually, but lifting. And we've got that same kind of lifting here in central Washington. So finally we're back to Washington and now we get these gadgets that the Chinook people didn't have. The GPS receivers that are anchored per, uh, permanently into the bedrock up on Mount Olympus, at Elma, all places, on top of Lind Hall, 
we have a network of hundreds of these receivers. And they have been planted around the Pacific Northwest in the last 20 years. And a major discovery was made about the crust of the Pacific Northwest using our instruments. Pretty cool. And it helps explain why our ridges exist. So let me help you read this. The red dots are the GPS receivers anchored permanently in the bedrocks. They communicate to Central's campus every half second their precise latitude and longitude. And if there's any movement over the course of a year, or in the case of a major earthquake, over the course of a couple of seconds, our network can detect that. So these arrows are talking about movement, not only of the receivers, but of the crust beneath. So in other words, this is detecting tiny movements in the crust of the Pacific Northwest. Am I off on a tangent? I am not. We're going to eventually talk about why these ridges, like Manashtash, started to grow. So here's the length of movement 10 millimeters per year, one centimeter of movement per year. So the longer the arrow, the more movement annually. So this is more than an inch of movement in Northern California to the northwest. The movement in Western Washington is about 10 millimeters, maybe 15 millimeters to the northeast. So this seems to contradict what I just said about plates, but it does not. The North American plate does move west. The entire plate moves west a couple inches a year. But within, this is what's cool, within that westward drifting raft, there is rotation. There is deformation within the leading edge of the North American plate. And this beautiful clockwise rotation of this crust, previously undetected until about 10 years ago, now shows us why we have this crustal compression in central Washington. Because notice, these stations up here aren't playing the game. They're not rotating. They're part of North America's drift, but they are not, for whatever reason, rotating. And so we're, we're taking this screen door, basically, this back porch screen door, and we're slamming it into central Washington. And the result are Menashtash Ridge, et cetera. So here it is, a different way. Everybody's rotating around Pendleton, Oregon, of all places. <laughs> yeah, a little animation, mercifully without me in it. So this Wanda Hooter plate is moving towards us here. Sierra Nevada block pushes on the southern part of the Oregon Coast Range block, which pushes on the Washington Coast Range block. British Columbia doesn't go anywhere. Seattle gets stuck. Our ridges are right in here. Remember our northwest-southeast orientation? And they are from crustal compression. We we're trying to figure out why that was. Now we've got it. It's not so much a direct motion, motion of the Juan de Fuca plate. It's this rotation within. And we now are worried about shallow earthquakes happening on the eastern side of the Cascades. It's all tied together. Now we don't have a new middle school because of this rotation. If you're not from here, you don't get that. Okay. <laughs> so, Ellensburg, Yakima, Tri-Cities, Portland, we want to look at these ridges. Look at them. Look at their orientation. They're folds. It's like dragging your foot on a, on a kitchen rug along the linoleum, and you're folding it up. We're folding it with this clockwise rotation, detected by the GPS stations. This compression. And this rotation started 10 million years ago. Better get that one down. 10 million years ago, the <coughs> rotation begins. So that means 10 million years ago, these ridges started to grow. Which means 10 million years ago, the Yakima River Canyon started to cut. That was a big moment. Did you feel it? That was it. We just talked about the age of the Yakima River Canyon. The canyon has not always been here. Let me say it again. This rotation started 10 million years ago. The compression started 10 million years ago. The ridges started to grow 10 million years ago. Therefore, uplift intensifies erosion. The Yakima River got frozen stage four and started to cut into the crust and continues to this day. All of its energy is devoted to cutting as opposed to going on to stage five. 
Oh, that was exciting. Let's let's uh, let's let's uh, let's come off of that high. Uh, the only point here is that we are now realizing, with more work done on these folds and faults east of the Cascades, that there's it's more likely than previously thought. It's more likely that these structures uh, continue through the Cascades and merge with faults on the west side of the mountains. So it wasn't long ago we were sitting here going, yeah, those poor suckers over there got all sorts of earthquake issues. Well, it's now looking like we're sharing some of these structures, that their faults are our faults. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> <laughs> and it's more than faults. So here's Baldy, two-thirds of the way down the canyon, major fault found by layers that are broken, and major folds. You can see the, the devastation from this compression. Layers that were originally flat have been folded almost on their heads to form these ridges. So remember, the river got its course in stage four, area was flat, 10 million years ago, we start the compression, we start to fold these guys, and the canyon starts to work. Make sense to you? Hope so. Right, so I hope you're all A, not B, not all of the above. The Yakima River was here first. To finish things out, um, right, to finish things out, I've got a couple minutes left, to show you that this is still in the works, that this is not an old system that is now dead there was a pretty impressive debris flow in 1998 with a lot of rocks that came down and buried the road uh, during a freak hail and rainstorm. Fourth of July weekend, actually, people partying down there and, and the, the road was, was blocked off with all this rock on it. Uh, and, and so we're out here looking at these rocks that came down off the hill. This is part of the process. This is, this is still uplifting, intensifying erosion. And so, oh yeah, okay, right. So here's a little reconstruction of that event in 98. Guys, super tiny minerals, can't really identify anything. The point is, every one of these rocks at this site, big or small, basalt. Careful observation of both river rocks and these mysterious basalt blocks lead us to an important conclusion. The event to bring these rocks into these piles had to have happened quickly, not slowly, over thousands of years. We have no tumbled rocks here. There was no time to create rounded rocks and to sort them by size. This had to have been a quick event. And since the rocks are all basalt, and since there are clear paths to the adjacent ridges, otherwise known as arroyos, a geologist working here can build a convincing case that these rocks are the result of a debris flow, a dramatic slurry of rock and water that flows down steep slopes, often associated with violent weather. Once the field geologists determine the event, the next task is to determine the age of the event. Using volcanic ash layers above or below the deposit, would be an example of how we can figure out when the event happened. For this particular set of debris flows in the Yakima River Canyon, we have a more accurate method to date the event. Eyewitness accounts, weather records, and aerial photographs. On the afternoon of July 3rd, 1998, Ellensburg experienced a rare, intense precipitation event an area that normally receives an annual nine inches of precipitation per year. The Ellensburg area received two inches in two hours. Heavy rain mixed with hail battered the high ridges that tower over this section of the canyon. There was no time for the water to soak into the subsurface, so most of the water began running <coughs> over the surface, picking up blocks of the salt as it traveled. All right, so this is a classic photo in a, in a paper by Marty Katz, the late Marty Katz, uh, uh, to document this debris flow. And, and, and so this is kind of what we want to visualize 
all through the history of the Yakima River Canyon development. I mean, it's one thing to say now that uplift is intensifying erosion, but it's not, you know, a, a hot knife going through warm butter, right? There's these, just these fits and starts of a lot of rock coming down as we continue to uplift these ridges. And so, you know, we've, we had another one of these events uh, last winter, I guess it was, maybe two winters ago, I've already forgotten. So this will continue, and the process will continue. But the canyon as we know it is not dead, is my main point. Okay, so, shit, hang on, hang on. All right, so uh, this is the last thing I want to show you. But if this stuff interests you, and we do a fair amount of public stuff. Now, students, you're overwhelmed and you're stressed out, and there's no way you do anything extra than you actually have to do. But I'm talking to other people in the room. Um, we do have some evening lectures with this kind of stuff. We do field trips out into uh, the local countryside. And, and we're, we're continuing to make these little videos, especially if you're teaching. You might be wanting to use a few of these things. I've been going more recently with a different model. I mean, even 10 minutes seems too long now when I'm teaching. So I'm now down to two minutes saying, hey, how's it going? You're back. All right. So now we're up to two minute uh, video uh, dedicated. And we made one for the Yakima River Canyon. And uh, these haven't been out there yet. I'm not really sure how to distribute them, actually. But my point is, if you teach especially, or if you whatever, uh, look for these coming uh, this spring. We're going to get them out there. And as I was going to say, if you want to stay in the loop with videos like this or geology type stuff, uh, I've got a little email list sign up sheet. If you want to add your email list to this, you'll get two or three emails from me a month. It's probably too much, but I'm try to try to keep it low. Okay, so this is a website that, that Dan was talking about in the introduction, hugefloods.com. It's devoted primarily to the Ice Age flood story, which is a whole other topic in eastern Washington. It's put together by a friend of mine, Tom Foster, who grew up in Ellensburg. He now lives in the Tri-Cities, but he and I have been working together recently to make these little movies. He's gifted with a camera and everything else, and I just show up and say a few words. So, this is a summary. Two minutes. Today in two minutes. Let's see if it works for you. Oh, my God. Let's see if this works. Oh, this is louder. Hello, young people. The trench meanders the Yakima River just south of Ellensburg, Washington. Meanders are a feature of old age these sweeping curves of the river. As rivers age, they develop more and more exaggerated meanders. We know this by flying over the Mississippi River system. And we see all stages of meander development back there. Eventually, the meander becomes so exaggerated that that curve is abandoned and an oxbow lake is formed and the channel becomes straight again. We can only develop these curves when an area is flat, like back east at the Mississippi. And here we've got these exaggerated curves as well, which means central Washington used to be flat. But there's a twist. This place isn't flat anymore. This is a deep canyon system. So to understand that twist, how about we get up on that rim and get a big picture view of the Yakima River Canyon. Let's go up there. <laughs> High up above the Yakima River, on the rim of the canyon, looking down, is one of our meanders. We know about meanders. The meanders got established when the area was flat, a subtle curve becoming a more exaggerated curve. But then we froze the position of this meander, and we entrenched it. Entrenched meanders tell us that the land is lifting against the river. The river wasn't up here and was cut down. We're sure that the river has been down there for millions of years. And the land has been lifting against the meander, against the river. The river's been cutting, matching an uplift rate of the bedrock, basalt layer after basalt layer, exposing themselves on the way up. The future of this meander is not more exaggerated meander, 
development of an oxbow lake. Instead, the future of this curve is more cutting because the uplift continues here in central Washington. Entrenched meanders just south of Ellensburg, Washington. <laughs> All I hear is sea. Coolies, rocks, and canyons is scenery. I care for you and me. Thank you for coming. Thanks for coming back, buddy.